So thank you guys so much for joining me today. My name is Jess and I work at GNS Business Communications. And today we are going to be talking with two of my colleagues, Meredith and Chelsea. Um, this is for our Women's History Month blog series or vlog series. And today we're gonna to be talking about living single in the city during the pandemic. And this was such an amazing topic that I know I wanted to get into. And I would really love to hear both of your perspectives on this. Um, so I wanna really kick it off and jump right into it. Everyone left New York City when the pandemic hit. It was a mass exodus, if you will. So I wanna know from you both, and I'll kick it to Meredith first. First, what, how did that make you feel? Like, what was it like seeing that mass exodus in New York City when the pandemic first hit a little over a year ago? It was sort of overnight, which is crazy for New York. The first couple of days went after the actual shutdown when we weren't, you know, supposed to be leaving while everybody was figuring things out. It was like, I explained it, there was like five o'clock in the morning on a Saturday in New York where people are kind of milling about, but they're not out. And it's a little bit ghost town. It was very weird. And I had different doctor's appointments or things that I was going to. So I would walk there generally. And I chronicled it at the time. And it was very, it was like apocalyptic movie for those first couple days definitely weeks and in a couple months and so that was for me very disconcerting peaceful but very disconcerting yeah i think for me um you know early on clients or even just friends and family from other places i'd get on the phone and they'd be like oh what's it like there knowing that new york was one of the places that was impacted so heavily so early and my kind of go-to answer would be, I don't know. That's the point. I'm, I'm watching this all from a screen from inside my apartment, just like everybody else. Um, and I, I found the whole mass exodus part to be a really interesting opportunity to kind of think about the privilege that comes with that. Because with so many people who were able to leave, you know, that, that have the ability that either already have a home somewhere else or a foundation to build one somewhere else, um, you know, that's just so much not what all of New York is. So when people talk about like, oh, you know, New York's never going to be the same. New York is is done for in its current kind of um, iteration of being this place where everybody's always out. Everybody's always doing things. For so many people, this is just home and um, will continue to be home after this. So like my neighborhood in particular up in Inwood, you know, it we didn't feel that type of mass exodus the way that some other neighborhoods did. And I think it does really kind of reinforce like what the real New York is and that that part is never really going to go away. And I, I found it really interesting to sort of see how that played out throughout the whole thing. I really felt it on the Upper East Side, especially because those that you know have summer homes in the Hamptons, they would, once it started to warm up, they all definitely left. They left if they had another place to live they left for sure. And so that made it feel a little bit desolate. And there's so many businesses up here that rely on you know restaurants and other things that, you know, there weren't people coming up here. Yeah, similar to you, Meredith, I would go into Midtown for doctor's appointments. And I remember getting off the train um, in Times Square, probably this was maybe May or June, to walk to a doctor's appointment. And that feeling the most bizarre thing to see Times Square mostly empty, boarded up, nobody, you know, no vendors on the street, no nothing. And that to think that it has now been like that for a year, it's Times Square is so bizarre. So bizarre. Thank you guys for that. Um, I mean, it's so eye opening because I think Chelsea, what you were saying, you know, the, the real New York, like it's, it's not just about Manhattan. Um, and, you know, like, you know, the certain in Midtown, um, there are so many other areas in the city where life kind of went on as usual, where things didn't change. But then you had Meredith's perspective where things completely changed and everything was desolate. So it's so interesting to hear, but I, I kind of want to get your perspectives now on how did you guys cope with those changes? Um, you know, and I'll kick it to Chelsea. How did that make you feel like where it was like everything kind of went on as usual, but yet you were still in your apartment, not going out? Yeah. Um, in terms of how did I cope with it? I think, I mean, realistically cannot well be an answer. Um, I, I, you know, it's a situation that inherently breeds a bit of a depressing feeling where 
on the outside, you have this really overwhelming kind of helpless situation where the greater part of society is like facing mortality in this really extreme way. And it's this really kind of incomprehensible crisis that everybody's going through. And then to, to cope with that and to kind of reconcile with the trauma of that, we're doing all the things that are bad for you to do. We're staying inside. We're not getting exercise. We're not seeing our loved ones. And I think for me, coping with it was just about recognizing that and that there were going to be limitations to how to cope because the things that are healthiest for us to do are just not available to us. So I think for me, it was about acknowledging that it was about acknowledging that it was going to be a roller coaster. There were going to be weeks that I felt okay. There were going to be weeks that, you know, I had the zoom fatigue or I, I, you know, Meredith, I don't know if you can relate to this, but social media was kind of a blessing and a curse where it was both a window into the outside world, but then at the same time, kind of a weird form of gaslighting of seeing some people just not take precautions the same way other people maybe were. And it just kind of creates a really weird experience of trying to put together what the outside world is right now when your world is just so insular. I couldn't agree more. And those first couple of months, it was, we were seeking out the Zoom. Now we've got Zoom fatigue, right? And we're trying to, now we're trying to learn how to balance that. But at the time, that was our only form of connection. So I my birthday is in April. And as some of you know, like this was the first, one of the first rounds of birthdays. And I was like, that's it. I'm going to have everybody come to a Zoom and it'll be great. And that was my attempt of, of normalizing what have been a, like a fun time out together with people. It was nice because we were able to, I was able to see a lot more people across, you know, different, you know, you know, families and groups and friends. But it was it was sad, and the other thing too, to your point about how how we are trying to make it a little bit better and, and manage it. The 7 p.m. clap, which was a big thing in New York, celebrating the first responders, that was really something to look forward to. I would open my window up and I'd be like, you know, I'd clap and I'd get really excited, and then it was like a moment of connection, which New York is so great for, and and why people love it and will always continue to come back to New York because you don't. You don't always feel that level of connectiveness. Both of those answers were, I mean, fantastic to me. I, I, I love hearing those perspectives and you both kind of touched on something, connectedness. So, you know, and, and Meredith, I'll, I'll kick it right to you. You know, you said like New York is great for that now and that you had your first birthday, I mean, your birthday last year over Zoom. So was it difficult not being around family and friends? Like, was it difficult to kind of have like your your birthday? It was like, well, this is like the first, okay, now we're kind of going into your almost your second birthday. Like, you know, was it difficult not being able to have like friends and family around? Or, you know, did you want to like try to find ways to go see them or see others? Yeah, it was, it was tough, but I was trying to make the best of it just because, you know, that's why we were like making fun cocktails and making bread and things. It was like, what are the things that we can't normally do? And a lot of people with, you know, extended family in their homes, they were reconnecting in different ways. For those of us that were on our own, we were seeking out connection through, like you said, Chelsea, social media, and just like where our people are. And a lot of people did check in on us. Um, I think I did it in a way that made me feel <laughs> supported at the time and, and sought out things over the next couple of months, but it was still so early on at that point. Yeah, I think for me, um the challenge of being away from friends and family, I'm somebody who is naturally a little bit more of a loner, a little bit more on the introverted end of the scale, which is, you know, in our industry, which is sort of inherently extroverted, it's sort of always been a balancing act for me. But this has been such an extreme form of isolation. And part of what really helped me the most was talking to friends that were also going through it while living alone, um, who were experiencing it the same way and could relate to god i'm so sick of the sound of my own voice <laughs> or like my cats are so sick of me and don't want anything to do with me anymore um i think that you know being able to still relate to other people's experience by connecting whether it's over social media or zoom or a phone call or playing a video game together or whatever we could find as something to do together in a more remote way um that was helpful in, you know, in making it less hard, not being able to see friends, whether one's here in the city or 
family, you know, back home who I haven't been able to see. Um, I think just trying to make a conscious effort to stay in touch in those ways um, mm -hmm. really kind of helped over the course of the whole year. You know what it reminds me of, Chelsea, the, the meme that was going around about um, your introvert friends are like having the best time ever. Your extrovert friends are not okay. Check on them. And that's really true. And, you know, I can, I have those moments too, where I'm kind of okay being alone, but you, it, you soak up those togetherness times so that you need that time apart. But if it's only time apart, that's when it's hard. So I know my frequency with my friends has changed. Actually, I have one friend out in Pittsburgh who definitely reaches out to me more often. We talk much more often than we ever did before. And I think it's a product of, of just making sure we're all okay. Yeah. I mean, um, a weird positive experience at all this for me is one of those close friends who was also living alone that, we kind of found an opportunity to reconnect and, and talk more often throughout this process just because we could really relate to what each other was feeling um, is now my partner because we had that opportunity to kind of put aside the rest of day-to-day -day life because we don't live in the same place and really kind of share that experience together and um, build a relationship out of that, which is an unexpected outcome of a year in quarantine, but I'll take it. <laughs> So last question, guys, and thank you so much for this conversation. I wanted to know, what are your takeaways from this entire experience? And I'll kick it off to Meredith. Say yes to the happy hour. If you're like, oh, I can't go out, just say yes to the happy hour. We have to live our lives. It's, you know, taught us that, you know, when we have to be locked down, it can be really tough. So there's, you know, even like Chelsea, you're saying, you found the opportunity to reconnect with a partner and build something together. We really just need to, to live our lives, embrace that flexibility at home. And um, I think that's a takeaway for me. Yeah, I think for me, the biggest takeaway is just reinforcing the importance of empathy. Um, you know, caring about your neighbor by wearing a mask, caring about the workers you're encountering day to day who don't have the luxury of working from home like we do. And then for our colleagues who do work from home, having patience when their kid or their pet or whoever is running in the background while they're trying to make that work. Um, and also caring for the people who are normally a part of your day to day life by making the effort to connect with them. Like Meredith said, say yes to the Zoom happy hour. Um, just for the sake of keeping those relationships healthy and thriving, even in these circumstances. I mean, we we have a light at the end of the tunnel now. I don't know how it's going to feel to go back to a new normal in New York or whatever it looks like, but it at least seems real now in a way that for many months it did not. So. Well, this was great. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate both of you taking the time today to speak with me and giving your perspectives about living single in the city during the pandemic. Um, so thank you once again, and I hope to see you guys in person really soon. Thanks, Jess. Miss you. Miss you. Miss you both. Thanks, Jess. <laughs> Thanks.